Hello folks, welcome back to another fantabulous video of Gairi and Sarsai. Today, we shall be discussing about a topic of utmost importance that is deep vein thrombosis. It is the formation of semi-solid coagulum in the deep venous system. It is the most common direct cause of death in surgery patients. In normal veins of the body, walls are usually present which assist in hemodynamic flow of blood to the heart and also prevent their backflow. However, in the case of deep vein thrombosis, a thrombus is formed in the deep veins usually of the leg. The thrombus usually consists of a fibrin meshwork, platelets and RBC. And sometimes the thrombus may get dislodged from the deep veins of leg and may travel as an emboli to the inferior vena cover from where this can travel through the heart to the pulmonary artery where it is impacted and may cause the pulmonary embolism which is the most fatal complication of deep vein thrombosis. Factors that lead to deep vein thrombosis fall under the common criterion of virtuous triad. The three components of virtuous triad are endothelial injury, the stasis of the blood flow and hypercoagulability. Now this endothelial injury exposes the collagen and several tissue factors which attract the platelets to the site of injury and they ultimately cause the addition and activation of several other platelets finally leading to formation of a platelet plug. And after that, the coagulation cascade is also activated whose final product is fibrin. This fibrin forms a meshwork around this platelet plug and this fibrin meshwork along with this platelet plug is what we commonly call the thrombus. And the next factor responsible for thrombosis is a stasis or stagnant blood flow. It occurs in conditions where the blood flow becomes turbulent or in the long periods of inactivity of skeletal muscle pumps such as bed rest which are most generally observed in post-op patients in long flights or in long car trips. Stasis also rushes platelets and other clotting factors to the site of endothelial injury and also activates the coagulation cascade and thereby leads to thrombus formation. And the final factor that leads to development of deep vein thrombosis is the state of hypercoagulability. In this, the altered amount of clotting factors increase the primary or secondary hemostasis. It can be observed in certain hereditary conditions where there is deficiency of antithrombin protein C and protein S. It can also be observed during various surgical interventions where there is endothelial injury. Normal medications such as oral contraceptives and clofibrate also aggravate the problem of hemostasis by increasing the clotting factor and decreasing the anticoagulant factors. The symptoms of deep vein thrombosis are most commonly felt or observed in lower limbs usually below the knee. The patient presents with an inflamed leg with the usual signs of inflammation such as pain, swelling, warmth and redness. In some patients, Phlegmatia cerulea dolens is observed, which is the painful blue limb occurring due to thrombosis in iliofemoral veins of leg. And suspected patients of pulmonary embolism complain of dyspnea and respiratory distress. And now the question arises, how will you clinch the diagnosis of DVT? First of all, we do some serological tests such as liver function test and electrolyte urea creatinine to identify the factors which might have precipitated DVT. The parameters such as international normalized ratio and activated partial thromboplastin time gives us some idea about the clotting abnormalities present in the body. Elevated D-dimer values indicate the presence of clot within the body. But the investigation of choice for DVT remains the venous duplex ultrasound scan which helps us to identify the exact location of clot within the vein. For instance, this is the duplex scan of a clot present in common femoral vein. We can diagnose the suspected case of pulmonary embolism by doing CT angiography of the pulmonary artery. As you can clearly see in this angiogram, this is the pulmonary artery and this is the embolus present within the pulmonary artery. Now coming to management of deep vein thrombosis, the most important aspect is the anticoagulant therapy. For the first 5 days, we administer low molecular weight heparin and heparin and after that only warfarin therapy continues. For the first episode of DVT, we administer this therapy for the period of 3 months. But if there is recurrence of DVT, then we have to administer it for lifetime. The target INR value 
in the case of DVT for us remains in the range of 2 to 3. We can also implant IVC filters in the inferior vena cava. These filters are commonly known as greenfield filters and these are indicated when the anticoagulants are contraindicated when the pulmonary embolism does not subside after the anticoagulant therapy or in the case of persistent pulmonary hypertension. These filters prevent the embolus from reaching the heart and thereby the pulmonary artery. We can dissolve the clot by using thrombolytics such as streptokinase and urokinase. We can prevent deep vein thrombosis in susceptible person by using either the mechanical methods or the pharmacological methods. In mechanical methods, we do early ambulation or we make the patient wear the pneumonic compression stockings. So, drugs such as low molecular weight heparin and direct TNA inhibitors such as rivaroxaban can also be employed in prevention of deep vein thrombosis. The pharmacological methods are considered more superior than the mechanical methods. Okay folks, that's all for today. Do like and share the video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for the journey of advanced cognition.